Hi, uh, I hope I'm audible. Okay. Hello. Can someone confirm that whether I'm audible or not? Oh, yes, then give me a sec. Yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, like previous session, we'll just go over the assignment answer before we start discussing some of those concepts that were dealt in the week four uh, and the clarification on the tropical versus subtropical cyclones also right yeah so Let's just in let me just start the screen share and then we can start. And in the in the meantime, if you have any uh, doubts or anything, do feel free to type in the chat box or unmute yourself and then ask. Okay. Then just start. So yeah, hi everyone, thank you for joining for today's So yeah, this is another week of conservation geography problem solving sessions. So yeah, let's just start with the week three as ans uh, questions. Yeah, there's a mistake from my end. You will just keep seeing week one, but it's just week three. So I hope you guys have gone through uh, as submitted those assignments. But yeah, let's just go through those answers quickly. Waxy is an example of whether it's a cleavage, structure, luster, or a streak. It's an example of luster. I think this is much more towards uh rocks uh because that week three mostly deals uh, deals about uh, lithosphere and ease of passage of light through minerals is known as <clears throat> so if if, the, if this mineral can easily pass the light through it whether what is it called as transparency fracture structure streak this is lot more straighter it's, it's just transparency if any material has the ability to pass light through it you, you you just use the word transparency and yeah unassorted coarse and fine debris left by melting glaciers so as the glaciers melt and then the glacial retreats happen there's a lot of debris that these glacier leave Often with angular to subangular rock fragments. So there are different types of rocks that just leave. This is the definition of what? Whether it is glacial till, outwards deposit, esker, or drumlin. So since we are talking mostly about glacier glaciers, so it has to be glacier till. But this is what it does. So as a glacier melts and then leaves the debris, so that is called as glacial till.
green or black colored inosilicates forming 10% of the earth's crust is a description of which mineral so here is example uh, this so whether it is amphiboles quads field spar or pyroxene so pyroxene the, the one that the thing that you are you will be able to you are seeing in the image here is oh sorry yeah so this is the this is one of those inosilicates forming that forms up to 10% of the earth crust it's called pyroxene so the rich where two cirques meet is the definition of so if you remember uh, we are talking about cirques right when, when there is a ridge where two cirques meet is the definition of an arete so these are terms that you we are discussing uh, that was discussed when you are talking about glaciers like and mechanical action of ocean waves is an example of it's more of a physical weathering because it's constantly physically uh, the ocean waves are kind of acting upon whatever the material is and then kind of weathering it so it, it's more of a physical weathering so sudden cooling of magma so if you remember the rock cycle when magma cools there is certain types of rocks that are formed so which is igneous rocks right immediately so sudden cool if, if they so there, there's a different type of igneous rocks that are formed based on how the magma is cooled if it's cooled suddenly it will lead to certain type of rocks versus if it cools slowly there's other type here sudden cooling leads to more smooth grain igneous rocks and gypsum is an example of so gypsum is what you can see here is an example of what type of rock whether this is silicic lactic rock carbonate rock evaporite rock or phosphatic rock so whether based on the composition what it is it's an evaporite rock and that <coughs> sorry thermal stresses lead to what does it lead to whether it's chemical weathering physical biological or none of the above so it's mostly physical weathering sim similar to ocean waves so generally what happens as thermal stresses is basically you know heating or and or cooling and or cooling of the rocks if you're talking about weathering of rocks as such so that kind of actually heating and cooling will lead to expansion to contraction of the rocks and then kind in the long run leads to splitting of rocks and then so on it can lead to weathering so it's more of a physical process so which of these are correctly arranged as per most scale from softest to hardest so most scale is a scale as you can make it out from the question itself it will is helpful for arranging items on an order of the smoothest to or the softest to the hardest to penetrate or to break so here we have options talc diamond calcite field spar apatite so we all know that you know diamond is one of the hardest uh, you know hardest element of these and then that has to be the hardest so and talc basically the powder uh, that some of the, sometimes we use it for various purposes is to be softest so it, it has to be one of these three and it is talc followed by calcite followed by field spar field spar sorry and diamond so this is how uh, the most scale of hardness looks like where, where things fall so if you look at our fingernails which we have, we can easily bite most of us do so, do. so it, that's where the talc and gypsum comes in so they, they are relatively very soft and coins they are in they are around calcite that's that's what we have here 
and field spar is much more harder than that and diamond is the hardest and there are synthetic materials that have been created that are much more harder than diamonds but naturally occurring materials I think if I'm not wrong diamond is the hardest oh sorry yes so yeah that's all for <coughs> uh, week three's uh, answer solutions uh, I hope you guys have already written the uh, assignment and then hopefully have done well so yeah we'll slowly go ahead and discuss more uh, of week four about atmosphere and other things related to it so what is the thing that comes to your mind when you when you think of this word or when you you know hear this word atmosphere air yes air any other thing <clears throat> Anybody else? You know, when when I, when I think of atmosphere, I think it as a you know warm, cozy blanket. You know that that is, uh, you know, that wraps the earth. You know, it, it's a blanket of itself. It's majorly it's a blanket of air. And yeah, it has it has a lot of things. Uh, it, it serves a lot of purposes and. It's one of the reasons, uh, you know, why we, we have the way we, we have the earth in most case. Uh, if, if you can see from this image, you know, it's not a uniform, it's not a single component. It, it, it is made up of multi, multi layers, you know, as, as you can see, right? And you might have heard of this earlier also. It is made up of multiple layers, right? Uh, starting with troposphere which is the lower most layer the layer that we mostly spend mo our lifetimes in and this this layer stretches up to 11 kilometers into about above the surface and then followed by stratosphere so this is the layer that is immediately above troposphere that stretches till 50 kilometers and then followed by mesosphere and then the final one thermosphere and the final one is the exosphere meso being the middle one so there are two layers above the mesosphere and then two layers below the mesosphere and most of our activities are constrained to troposphere and the stratosphere is where a lot of flying happens commercial flights and then uh, this And you know the other other type of aircraft might fly much more higher. And thermosphere and exosphere are the places where most of the satellites are concentrated around. And then these beautiful aurora formations that you might have encountered or have you know witnessed, they happen mostly in the thermosphere region, right? So, but you know uh, things are not uniform like you know if you talk about temperature or what's the general thing I mean temperature like as you go in height the temperature kind of drops down by certain degrees right but here as you go much more higher the temperature actually uh, not not only drops down there is a increase in temperature also right if you see this graph uh, let me just get the pointer if you see the graph here so yeah so this is the line for temperature just and then 
this is a z this is the zero degree line and then this is a negative temperatures right uh, as you go from the so earth surface as your elevation or altitude increases the temperature drops right it drops till the transition between troposphere and stratosphere and then it starts increasing again till mesosphere and then again drops down and then this just goes on right and then so it's it's not constantly decreasing or constantly increasing it, it just increases and decreases increases again so this happens due to you know the composition of different gases that we have and then different uh, phenomena that occur in in these layers and then we have our ozone layer uh, in stratosphere and the pressure however constantly goes decreases as you, as our elevation increases so it, it's it's not a constant it just there is a burst in between also so from roughly one atmospheric pressure on the surface the the or, or basically the uh, the pressure that we experience at on at sea level uh, is what we call as one atmospheric pressure and then this goes on decreasing as you reaches outer space there, there is absolutely no pressure in that areas so the vehicle the space vehicles that goes up into space they have to pressurize or even the airplanes that go up into the atmosphere or till the stratosphere they have to pressurize the cabins because the pressure outside is so low and then the pressure also increases as you go down into the ocean because of the water water being a, being a much more denser material okay so yeah so that's just atmospheric layers and then condensation nuclei are, are, are really important you know this is a uh, that leads to formation of precipitation right so what are these condensation nuclei these are just uh, some uh, you can think them of aerosols or particles that are dispersed are present in the air uh, th this acts as a backbone for the water vapor at these higher elevation higher altitudes to condense so that the water vapor can stick to this uh, nuclei condense and then precipitate so the, the, the there are naturally there different there are a number of uh, condensation nuclei that happens be it uh, aerosols or other things however people started exploiting this phenomenon that you know the water vapor needs some sort of uh, backbone like this condensation nuclei to be able to precipitate and then uh, you know precipitation to occur so they, they started this idea called cloud seeding so that you know uh, to encourage precipitation to happen so basically in cloud seeding what happens they, they take some sort of condensation nuclei mostly it can be silver iodide potassium iodide and even table salt because it kind of gathers a lot of moisture and then at this elevation and then you know that they, they go up in a plane and then around the clouds they just put up these uh, spray these condensation nuclei basically they like it's like putting up seeds into the cloud so that you know the water droplet can actually form and then precipitate action can occur and then that can eventually lead to precipitation but there's a lot of controversy behind whether it's okay to use whether it's not okay to use because you you can't really control even after the how much precipitation it can have it can you know can occur because because it, it's such a spontaneous thing that can occur so even in the recent floods that has happened in Dubai, like a couple of months back, you know, there was theories behind that, you know, they attempted to have some cloud seeding to get that rain, but it turned out to be much, much more disaster, which may be true, may not be true, we not sure, but yeah, so it's hard to control 
this cloud seeding even in sometimes back couple of years ago even india in india there were these talks of using cloud seeding uh, in particularly dry years also so that's where this condensation nuclei are really important and then since you're talking about condensation nuclei have you guys heard of this thing called nuclear winter if so what did you hear no okay uh so the concept is kind of similar to what we are discussing but uh, here it involves lit little more so it's a theory no one has actually tested we hope it's not it doesn't come to true so the thing is ki if a nuclear war happens between you know global superpowers so it's going to put up lot of this dust particles lot of these pollutants aerosols into the atmosphere that these aerosols will go high up into the stratosphere and then eventually you know block the sunlight right if you just look at here so it will go up into higher higher stratosphere and then it will stop much of the incoming radiation from reaching the surface of the earth if there is very little radiation that actually comes to the surface of the earth what will happen is basically the temperatures are going to drop substantially so and then since this is not just from uh these particles are not going to be just from the uh use of the bombs they are also from the destruction of you know the infrastructure we have or different pollutants getting released into the air this is going to be widespread and then given the currents air currents we have it's going to circulate all across the earth and then it it's going to form an entire blanket and my it, it will eventually kind of you know reduce the temperature of earth by lot of, okay uh so and then causing a continuous winter for for long period of periods of time till that all those particles are brought back onto the surface either in form of precipitation or they are they are you know separate, uh, congregated in specific regions by by those air currents so this is a theory and lot of people say that you know this may not be happen because of the scale some some argue that you know considering the secondary uh pollutants that are released from the destruction of cities or other things it, it is it may be bound to happen so this is also you know the particles actually absorbing much of the energy and then blocking the earth's sun's radiation to reach the earth's surface so yeah uh so going ahead uh so this is something yeah <clears throat> this is cyclones uh this is a phenomena you know which we have been listening from from you know from our childhood you know if especially if you are from the eastern coast of india you are brought you are bound to listen to you they, they, you know cyclones every you know during the season at least two to three cyclones are hitting our east coast so and then yeah it, these are going to just going to increase and they are not going to decrease at all and then lot of people you know lose a lot be it their lives or be their livelihoods of these cyclones and these are formed in different ways so there are tropical cyclones that happen in the tropical region that are you know mostly confined to tropical region and then subtropical cyclone cyclones or non tropical cyclones they are restricted to temperate regions mostly about 35 degree latitude line and then the way they are formed are different if you remember 
uh, most of the cyclones that hit the east coast are actually formed in the uh, you know bay of bengal which is a huge water body like is it so since our country is a trop- subtropical country or just close to tropic so and then these guys are originating from the ocean so these these are tropical cyclones so like the cyclone if i'm not wrong amphan and there are much more recent cyclones that you can see that have you know originated from the bay of bengal which is yeah so tropical cyclones generally are, are formed on from you know bodies of water generally that gets relatively warmer while uh, the subtropical cyclones they are not necessarily formed on water they are they can form on land also they are generally formed in regions where two air masses collide or interact uh, so so it's my typo it's hot sorry uh, interaction of cold and warm air masses right so if you know that you know the polar regions are much more colder tropic and subtropics are you know warmer as you go from you know equator to the poles either of the pole the temperatures kind of you know gradually decreases right so because of these decreases decrease in temperatures the air that circulates or or that air that originates from the tropical region tends to be warmer and the air that originates from the polar region tends to be much more colder because of you know everything is cool so the air eventually also you know is cold and then when these two actually interact so there is a huge uh, exchange in of energy that happens and then that leads to uh, formation of cyclones and the other thing about tropical cyclones since they are formed mostly on warm bodies of water as they reach land they their energy kinds of dissipates and then they it kind of actually slows down so if you remember from the new sellers that you have heard from you know the cyclones that have hit india on the east coast you may be you know you may be you have heard this thing you know after it makes landfall is where when it crosses the land or actually crosses onto the land and it starts weakening or the wind starts slowing down so it that that's what it is because it it started the cyclone has started dissipating most of its energy once it has made landfall because it's uh, it, it gets all of its energy from the wa- rising warm air on the warm water while temperate cyclones are another class because they are entirely fueled by these cold and warm air currents so they don't generally dissipate that easily on you know coming onto the land so <clears throat> how how of this how is this tropical cyclone form so if you look at uh, so this is what they show the visuals on tv or in newspapers so see this is how the cyclone is because we what we get is our tra- tropical cyclones it has a huge eye and then there's an eye wall and then yeah there are these spiral bands of clouds that we get to see from the satellite imagery right and then if you have watched, there are a lot of movies that have been made uh, of, from cyclones because there are these people uh, called storm chasers because they actually run into storms when actually people are running away from storms because uh, they are some people are actually doing it to gather scientific data to understand and predict the cyclones better because someone has to monitor the wind speeds how how much speed is the wind flowing how much is the rainfall actually present you know from from the start of the cyclone to the end of the cyclone in the eye itself so and then there are some people who do it just for fun and then they they also collect data because they are doing it anyway so yeah uh and the eye is one such depicted character in lot of these movies as this calm structure because you know it's such a beautiful thing to 
just watch the eye and it just comes uh, because you know the way the cyclone actually works makes the eye you know almost calm uh, if you see here if you take a cross section of this topic of a tropical cyclone this is how it looks so it has this lot of the spiral rain bats or uh, rain bands where you have you get uh, which leads to formation a lot of these rains and then you have the center eye and then the eye wall is basically the first rain band that surrounds the eye and then it just clouds clouds layers outflowing so how, how, how does it happens so as from the ocean surface as the warm air constantly rises above you know uh, you know heated air actually rises above uh, and then as it rises above it's it starts cooling down and then as it cools down constantly uh, that that ends up in a spiral right and yeah and then because of the winds also uh, it just starts spiraling around and then as it spends a lot of time and then the lot warmer the sea the more bigger and the more intensify the cyclone can get so there are different types of you know they are known by different names in different countries and there are different categories based on the you know wind speed and the destruction it can cause or the size it it has since most of these tropical cyclones originate on hotter water and we all know that you know with increasing global temperatures and then warming oceans there the number of cyclones are going to increase and then the not only the number but also the intensity of the cyclones are going to increase that's what a lot of studies are saying these days and then i think we are also witnessing a lot of them uh you know every year at least we have we are having two to three cyclones at least one or two to one is for sure but two to three it varies but earlier there ha there used to be very less or less frequent cyclones and then even the destruction these guys are ca causing these days is going to just increase and however if you look at the subtropical cyclone how it is formed uh, on the contrary so this is a warm front of air and this is a cold front of air so there are two fronts that actually meet right uh, yeah so yeah sorry yeah we, we just go from down so if there is a disturbance that happens here in the tropical region it it, it makes a for leads to the formation of a tropical storm right and then it becomes a tropical cyclone after it start dissipating energy and then start slowing down uh, if it hits a cold front of wind and then warm front of wind uh, it kinds of you know extends it yeah sorry this might not be a uh, right picture for subtropical cyclone but yeah if you just, just focus on these two uh, part of the picture uh, so where you know these these are actually formed during uh, warm where warm fronts and cold fronts actually collide so that's that's just just that thing yes uh, I hope that was clear somebody has asked this uh, last time okay great thanks yeah so have you heard of this word the Keeling curve and if so, if yes, 
what is it that you heard you have heard about this killing curve no okay so uh right so let me just put it this other way so so that you know you can better grasp it you heard you know we know that uh that global warming is happening right the earth's temperature is rising why because of there is one major gas uh that is contributing to the increase in global temperatures which is carbon dioxide right so so keeling curve is nothing but a graph of carbon dioxide concentration in air with time that's it that's as simple as that so keeling is the name of the person or scientist who actually started monitoring the carbon dioxide level uh you know at mauna loa lab observatory in hawaii so they actually started with two different one in the south pole and then one here but later on they just end up uh doing continuous uh, observations here itself so it, it's mauna loa is a volcano so they they started because since it is very far away from the from you know any of the nearby continents and then thus has little nearby pollution of carbon uh, you know so they started measuring the carbon dioxide levels in the air at that location and then this is named after charles david keeling the scientist who 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 started who you know measuring so how does it looks like so this is how it looks like so it kind of started somewhere around 1950s or 1960s you can think of it so it just a curve it just goes up and down up and down uh let me just right do it here so you know so it just goes on like this yeah my my drawing is bad but yeah so that's how it just there 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 are peaks and troughs right and then it's showing that you know the carbon dioxide level started when when from whence the observation has started they started from around 320 ppm and they are above 420 ppm right so that's what so they they use this graph so the study after they have found out that you know the actual uh t- carbon dioxide concentrations have already are increasing and then we know that you know carbon dioxide is a major greenhouse gas they started putting it uh in front of because they, these people are the scientists are from us their uh, uh, agency the science agency and then it it there there are a lot of things that happened and then they, they there are initially rejections you know uh that th- this is not the thing that this is not because of carbon dioxide and all but yeah later on when they had sufficient data to show that you know it's actually carbon dioxide has increased from you know for the past 50 60 years they said you know yeah that we have a problem with climate change and all and you know this whole graph there are peaks and uh troughs there are there, there is a sudden burst increase and there is a decrease so this is because of seasonal variation because um, we have much of the land mass if you remember from you know the earth the you know map of the earth we have most of our land mass in the northern latitudes right and northern latitudes experience summer during you know uh june to you know let's say spring and summer spring and summer during may to uh september that's the, that's when lot of these plants actually grow so as usual as because plants consume lot of carbon dioxide when they are growing up 
there is a drastic drop in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that happens because these gases are actively taking up but once they stop taking but since we are already we are continuously producing carbon dioxide the carbon dioxide levels keep increasing and then the, these peaks and troughs happen because of seasonal variation in uptake and then mostly attributed to plants and however but this uh, this just keeps on growing and yeah and then in, if you don't take action projections say that it's going to increase much more higher uh, so yeah before we go a little ahead do you think uh, this has happened this has ever happened in the past of earth's climate that you know the temperatures of earth have risen this high or is it just this time around because of human influence these temperatures are going this high or the carbon dioxide concentrations so you know uh so the question is uh as i was saying that you know the carbon dioxide concentration has been increasing a lot and then subsequent effect on the temperature is it's direct you know as the carbon dioxide levels increase so is that so does the atmospheric temperature is increasing do you do you think or do you know you know whether this is the first time in earth's history that the carbon dioxide levels have gone this much high apart from the time uh, from the you know prim primal atmosphere or is is it not the first time that uh, or do you think this has already also happened earlier in the past also that carbon dioxide and the temperature levels have gone higher in the earth's history Okay, I'll just wait for no idea. Okay, so the thing is, the Earth has gone through cycles. You know, if you remember from the lecture also, that you know the pri the earlier Earth atmosphere was much more. Uh, it has higher amount of carbon dioxide, and then you know, it was much more. The temperatures were much more higher, but as it started cooling down, and once uh plants started appearing and then the earth's atmosphere the cons carbon dioxide in that atmosphere started going down there ha there ha there have been you know cycling there there were these times when the its temperature has increased and there are these times that when the earth's temperatures have decreased but at the extent that it it is happening in the current times has not happened in the recent past right so that's why this is such a important thing to you know try to st stop or reduce yeah so have you heard of this term ice age or glacial maxima or if not at least watch the movie ice age there are four parts yeah okay uh those there 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 this set of series of ice age movies also made if you are interested you can go around and watch them so this is ice age or glacial maxima is the uh, time period where you know 
the temperatures on the earth have consistently are dropped considerably and much of lot of these land masses have also got connected because the glaciers were at their maximum that's why it's also called as glacial maxima and ice age is a term that is uh, kind of used for to for people to understand for for layman but uh yeah the, the the earth's temperatures have all gone down significantly for for a, a lot i'm not sure how many times but it has gone down yeah rec- uh, in the in earth's history however and then the stems times has started increasing also so this is a map of global temperature average temperature change you know roughly around 100 year 100 to year 2000 where you can see you know there is a warm period and then there is a slight decrease in temperatures and then so these fluctuations as you can as you're seeing are kind of moving around uh around here right but suddenly come 1950s see the rise in temperatures the temperature from 1950 and the temperature around 2000 there is almost an increase in a degree celsius of temperature and then you know the temperature has changed in the past and it has been changing over time but the way it is changing in the current time is what it is concerning that's that's that's, that's what is fueling a lot of these you know things that are happening whether it be uh demands for you know clim- mitigating climate change or adapting or lot of other things and yeah this, this is uh this is a map published by this studies by this collaborative study called seno grid so yeah there are different ep- ep- eras see, see the temperatures uh temperatures were very higher in the paleocene and eocene okay so this is the temperature difference compared to 1960s to 1990s temperature average and then what we are seeing is currently around 1 or 2 degrees roughly 1 to 1.5 degrees warmer than what it was in 1960s it was 8 degrees warmer or even up to 14 15 degrees warmer during the eocene right but it has cooled down significantly and then this is this is what cooling has happened <clears throat> and this is when you know uh some of those ice ages actually happened during those or the glacial maxima events happened during these cooling events and then after that the temperature has started again rising up but the way it has risen here is what was concerning this this the rise in more temperatures actually started around i think green uh, for the industrial revolution where you know a lot of these fossil fuels have started to be burnt and you might be wondering how how do we get to know uh, you know we have these monitoring techniques this sophisticated monitoring techniques somewhere around mid 20th century 1950s onwards but how do you get to know this all this past climate data so there are a lot of ways you can get to it so one major reliable source is drilling into these glaciers or drilling into this ice so we have these glaciers in antarctica we have these glaciers in arctic pole and we have these glaciers in even in the himalayas even most of the northern latitudes go dig it dig, you know you know how much precipitation actually happens and then you can eventually make out or you know year wise based on the stratification of the ice how it has snow how it has fallen on and the compression on you can eventually make out or you can use dating methods to say how how many years ago it was so what they do is like you can you know you can get the ice core out you can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in that uh band which you know you know which is which age time period it is from and then you know what's the ca- amount of carbon dioxide it was present and what the subsequent temperature can be so 
so most of this is from ISA or you can also use uh, deep sea course also sediment based studies to see you know what was the carbon dioxide levels du during those times and then we are not stopping there we are trying to project also there are these climate change projections that says you know by 2015 if you don't do this you will end up here or if you try cutting down your fossil fuels your you know temperatures are going to be here so and so we, we will i'll just come to those scenarios later on so so yeah that's how we we try to understand our past climate and so we we know that you know this is happening and then there is this uh intergovernmental panel that was formed it's called ipcc intergovernmental panel on climate change so last year it released this report and then if, if you are you know there, there is a report for general public that is easy to understand i would such strongly suggest you to go ahead and read that i'll just try to go over some of those things that are touched upon in the report here and there is a brief scientific basis on what the statements they are making so it's a collaborative of a lot of the scientists and the government bodies, governmental officials. So there are a lot of these climate change deniers. You might have heard or you might have experienced firsthand. So that say that, you know, the temperatures have risen in the past. It, are, it is also rising now. So what's the big deal? So the big deal is because there is a increase in emission of greenhouse gases. You know, if you see here, uh, there is a you know lot of increase in greenhouse gases, and that that that, that greenhouse gases are emissions are result of human activities. This actually leads to increase in concentrations. So we are increasing. That is increasing the concentration. And we know that, you know, this increasing concentration doesn't stop there. It actually interferes with the global surface temperatures. And then the sur global surface temperatures were also rising because of this subsequent increase. In. And then we know that we are responsible for that. So, it is us who, who are, you know, leading to this thing, this climate change. So, if you look at this graph uh, if you see you know observed warming so what is the warming that is observed roughly around one degree compared to 1850 to 1900 temperatures the if you just uh, look at the influence human influence actually you know uh, matches what is being observed if you model the amount of human influence, it actually uh, you know predicts what is absurd. So that says that you know we are responsible, and then this change is happening. This climate change is happening. There are several impacts of this human-caused climate change. This is this is not a natural phenomena. This is a phenomenon that we are causing. Uh, sorry, yeah. So, there are a lot of things that are going to happen. One is, you know, some of them are related to what we consume, water availability and food production. You know, uh, areas such as uh, deserts or even uh, uh, drier areas are going to get much more drier. And then so does... Uh, the f yield of a lot of these crops going to decrease because of less either due to less water or due to extreme temperatures and so is the impact on health and well-being so there are a lot of infectious diseases that are going to emerge like for instance uh, they can be vector borne diseases also let's say uh, mosquito borne diseases like such as malaria you know in the northern latitudes they you know, malaria does not generally spread because the host vector, 
uh, or the vectors, the mosquitoes cannot sustain uh, the colder winters in the northern areas. But as the temperatures are rising and the winter temperatures uh, are not go dropping so much down, these guys are happily colonizing these areas and then leading to spread of these diseases. And then there's a displacement of people that are happening, either, you know, because of the rising sea level, uh, people had to de be displaced from those areas or to a new area, so they are losing their livelihoods and all. Cities, settlements and infrastructures are getting damaged. Just take the example of Himachal Pradesh. You know, floods, these torrential rains last year and this year. It has, you know, almost more or less la last year it has crippled lot most of the state, the hilly regions of the state. Because, you know, they are wrecked to have work. It's, it, because it, it was uh, both a combination of western disturbances plus the monsoon. And then, and then there are the effects on, so, yeah, biodiversity and ecosystems itself, be it terrestrial, freshwater, ocean ecosystems, everything. So yeah, if you just look at the number of dots here, the more the dots, the high likely that scenario is going to happen. So biodiversity is going to be at the receiving end when it comes to climate change. And not only that, uh, their physical climate also is going to change. You know, uh, there is slightly uh, confidence, you know, that there is a chances in agriculture and ecological drought. Uh, there is likely in heavy precipitation because, you know, due to this shift in at, uh, atmospheric circulations, some regions are going to get much more drier and then those regions, some regions are going to get much more wetter because the winds might end up bringing a lot of water. Sorry. Lot of this precipitation and then just dump all of the water in just one place. That's also not good. Similarly, there's a lot of glaciers that are going to retreat that you might have heard of uh, and then rising sea levels. And virtually certain that's going to happen is ocean acidification. If it's a phenomena where, you know, lot if there is a higher increase in carbon dioxide level in the air, the ocean as it's a natural process where, you know, ocean kinds of dissolve some of the carbon dioxide and acts as a sink. Because carbon dioxide dissolves, as the carbon dioxide dissolves in the water, the pH kinds of decreases leading to acidification of the ocean. Similarly, increase in hot extremes. Even this year in India itself, we had a lot of these, you know, days that are very hot compared to, you know, breaking the previous records for the past two, at least two decades. That, you know, this was the hottest day in the past 20 years or 30 years. So the extreme events are also increasing. So how, how, how the world is going to look if you just just look at the temperature change graph. So if the world warms at 1.5 degrees, if the temperatures increase by 1.5 degrees, so this is how it's going to look like. So the temperatures change. Most of the India is going to get warm, uh, you know, at least warmer. But the worst scenario is 4 degree change most of the India gets warmer and even if you look at these northern latitudes the temperature is going to increase there much more drastically. Similarly precipitation is also getting affected and so on. The, the wettest day precipitation change. So yeah. So if you look at hot extremes uh, just look at the number of dots here also. The more the number of dots, the high likely that event is going to happen. Hot extreme events are going to increase in the Indian subcontinent. That's what the predictions say, the models say, the climate change models. So are the cases of heavy precipitations. It's not, the confidence is not that high, but it says it's going to increase. 
but there are some er areas you know where it might not increase or it might decrease also so yeah so what does the future scenario projection say so if you limit warming to 1.5 degrees celsius and then start cutting on uh, the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, we will follow a path uh, something like this the blue blue line but if you fail to stop at 1.5 which we have because from the paris cop 21 agreement we have there is by the time by this year i think we have consistently hit what plus 1.5 degrees from what the benchmark was set so yeah we had to aim now for two degrees because we failed 1.5 and if we fail to do that there are these worst case scenarios also <coughs> and yeah so even so the thing is so there can be argument you know just if you just cut it just today itself the impact is not going to be tomorrow because these gases tends to linger in the atmosphere for much more longer right so it will take time so that's what even if, if you just start acting now it will take a time for these gases to actually drop down in terms of the con concentrations and with the current policies we have in place it's just going to increase but we had to change our policies for these guys to go down and then so there is this concept of net zero so net zero carbon is basically you don't allow production of any more carbon or the release of any more carbon into the air you can ha you can harvest the carbon or recycle the carbon but you try to not release a lot more carbon dioxide into the air so that is the concept of net zero so this is all about net zero which is a much more optimistic thing let's hope they get to do it so there are multiple ways we can i uh, you know adapt and mitigation so as much most of the energy in most of the world is from you know burning of fossil fuels shifting to solar or wind or geothermal or nuclear power might be a mitigation option and there is this thing called carbon capture and storage where you actually actually capture the carbon dioxide and use it for other purposes or you capture the carbon dioxide and store it deep inside the earth like you know you dig up since we know uh, we get a lot of these fossil fuels by digging up these huge deep holes into the earth get tapping on those reservoirs once the fossil fuel has been emptied you can just pump pump back the carbon dioxide into those uh, empty reservoirs that are in the un underground so there are a lot of these companies and mostly in the european countries have started doing this and then they are doing it but it's a slow thing and yeah and there are other ways you can they if you go through the report you can get to see them yeah the link is down here if you want or you can just google ipcc 2023 report and yeah what does it report say is that you know there's a very narrow window to actually develop using climate resilience method so if you act here this is where we are this is where we wanted to do this is where we are if you start acting the results are going to come you know very slowly and then they also try to integrate uh, you know this has suggest using sustainable developmental goals there are this set of goals that have been proposed to you know develop sustainably keep being keeping in consideration of a lot of other things and if we try to adapt with that it's going to be helpful you know 
we are going to achieve these goals if you have you know like low emissions or transits transit into you know more energy efficient systems we are the effect we are going to have is going to change so yeah now just that just an idea on how you know things are changing and then there are things that we wanted to do to help us better stop these things from affecting us yeah and yeah just a thing just before we try to wind it up so what do you guys think you know we know that the temperatures are rising the climate change is happening it's it is having a lot of effect what do you think is the hottest survivable temperature for a human for us what do you think is temperature beyond which you know humans will just die if you are exposed to the temperature for so long 45 degrees uh, any other guesses anybody else there yeah uh <clears throat> 45 degrees not 45 degrees it's actually much more lower it is 31 degrees there's a study from australia i think if i'm not wrong so they they built up these chambers so the 45 degrees celsius is the out the uh, you know environmental temperature but we may not be experiencing the whole 45 degrees because you know we wear clothing or we take rest inside a uh you know under under a roof some sort of roof so if you are interested you might look further but yeah what they did was they, they did this wet bulb temperature so without any humidity or very little humidity and then they found out you know 31 degrees celsius if you are exposed to more than 5 hours you are just dead so that's what it takes and then since the temperature is rising so much we are very cl- we might not be very far from you know being able to experience that temperature and the marginalized community are going to get impacted much more than the elite communities so that that's one of the things in a sustainable development goals sdgs that says you know you need to lift those marginalized communities and then make them climate re- resilient the climate resilient development also talks about uh, you know being able to help those marginalized communities to survive this change also and what do you think are the effects on flora and fauna just to wind it up here climate change effects how how does climate change affect plants and animals displacement to various locations elevation okay elevate extinction uh, yeah elevator to extinction and the top species will get extinct okay yeah that's one thing this that that that's one of the major concern of species that are living in the higher altitudes that you know there is a as the temperature starts on increasing these peop- these animals or plants try to look out for the fa- that the, the the temperature that they are comfortable in and then this will keep on shifting and then these animals tends to reach go from bottom to up and then so on so on and then eventually they there is no more place at the top of those mountains 
for them to go to get those you know their favorable temperature and then this acts as escalator and then everything just goes extinct so this escalator to extinction and there are other and yeah so extinction is one thing that is good that it does time to happen because of change in climate and the other thing a uh, major thing that you might have seen you know uh, mass effects of ecosystems you know uh, the bleaching of corals right you might have heard in news that you know this year the great barrier reef has bleached again it has started bleaching so bleaching is a phenomena where you know uh, these corals have a symbiotic algae and then which produces food and then this coral also gets to have some of some of that food but as temperature increases the algae cannot sustain itself in those warmer seas they just kind of leave their partner or they just die once those algal partners die the corals doesn't have in don't get any food so they also die so once the algal partner die so the pigments they generally produce is what gives them color it everything just turns white so yeah so the the whole of the corals turn white that's why it's called bleaching because they are just losing their color so the whole ecosystems might actually be affected and then the species of fishes or birds that are dependent on these ecosystems these corals might actually simultaneously get affected so there is a shift in sex ratios right uh, we have a lot of these reptiles uh, that have this temperature dependent sex ratios where you know higher temperatures gives one sex low temperatures gives another sex and if you are rising temperatures all the species are of the same sex that's not going to help the species because without the opposite sex because they, they can't reproduce you know either by parthenogenesis if it's a female or by non reproductive way of repro so they they're just going to go extinct and then there is a huge shift in phenologies of species right if you if you come up higher in the himalayas here a lot of the species are shifting when they start flowering so what and earlier what the species that used to flower during you know once the snow melts somewhere around may and may may end has not actually shifted by at least one or two weeks and they are you know flowering by the first week of may the the, the species that used to flower start flowering at the end of may they are actually shifting their whole life cycle earlier and then not only flowering and then the impact it has on different organisms is going to be higher like you know a lot of uh, in these northern latitudes or even in himalayan region you know during the peak growth season is when there is a lot of food abundance right a uh, lot of plants means a lot of insects or fruits a lot of insects and fruits means a lot of birds or mammals can get to eat on depending on what they want, they they are eat so what is happening because of these shifts so generally birds if you just take the example of birds or mammals also uh, they time their reproduction and then their birth giving birth they give birth with that in mind uh, with the time period such that you know when they have to raise their young ones there there is a surplus amount of food because in if you talk about himalayas the peak growth season which happens roughly you know from july uh, mid to august mid or july to august you can think of that is when a lot of these species actually produce their young ones and then they have a lot of this food for for the young ones to eat or for the parents to gather to feed the young ones but the thing is because of the shifting and then this lot of these species are not able to keep track of what has been there for you know uh, hardwired into their bodies for you know lot of years and then because of the shifting of plants a lot of these uh, birds mammals the young ones are not able to get enough food during the peak season and then they are just kind of a uh, so lot of them are not able to grow or even some of them are growing up they are not in proper healthy condition and there are a lot of other effects that that are there
so there's there is a mismatch in production versus consumption so there are a lot of these examples that have been uh, found like you know a lot of these warblers and insects the insects are coming up quickly but warblers are you know at least one or two weeks behind uh, the peak growth of peak insect activity so they're essentially losing here on lot their food resource so they're kind of getting impacted by that and there are a lot of other impacts of climate change also which i think we can uh we will we'll catch up on slowly later on but yeah this this is some of those common ones or the ones that are really interesting to think of yeah i think that's all i have for today's session so yeah so yeah that's all for today if you have any questions or anything that you want me to talk about i'm happy to take or discuss with you guys Yeah, sorry for the video quality because of no electricity here. I'm not able to put it up. But yeah. Uh, adaptation options with suitable. So you mean by climate change adaptation options? Is it that thing? okay sure uh, if you want me to deal if you want me to talk about that in the next class yeah uh, i'll be happy to talk about that so yeah uh, but I would, I would suggest you guys to go ahead and give that ipcc report uh, a read because it explains a lot of these things in detail and in in you know in a friendlier terms but i would i will try to address those the topic little better so i'll try to put it up in terms of yeah okay then yeah anything else that's all i have for the day if not yeah i will end the session here if you have anything i'll be happy to address or else we'll end the session here that's all thank you <sighs> okay thank you then then we'll just stop the session here bye